Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. We're going to continue our study on the seven churches that we started last time. Today we're on the church of Smyrna. Now, as we looked at last time, there are three ways that we can study the seven churches. They are historical. They are real churches, real places, existed during the time of John. Number two, they represent the age of the church. The church would move through seven spiritual conditions as it approached the second coming of Christ. And the third way, probably the most important way as we sit here this morning, is your personal application. How does it apply to you? Are there problems? Are there good things that exist in the churches that Jesus is speaking to you personally about? Last time, we also looked at Revelation 1 briefly, where we found that Jesus stood among the seven candlesticks, and the seven candlesticks were the seven churches, right? And we said this is key to understanding these messages because there are hints, there are clues found in that candlestick, which is in the sanctuary, the holy place where Jesus would have ascended right there, beginning his work in the heavenly sanctuary. What were those keys and clues? Well, one of the things we notice is that those branches are connected intimately, aren't they? Ephesus, which we looked at last time, is connected to which church there? Laodicea. Laodicea. Does anybody remember what the parallels between those two churches are? Ephesus was the closest to Jesus' first coming, wasn't it, historically? Laodicea is the closest to Jesus' second coming. Did Ephesus understand their condition, or did they need a true witness to tell them their condition? Did Ephesus say, we've lost our first love? Or did Ephesus say, we've never lost our first love? Or did Jesus say, ah, so they're unaware of their condition. What about Laodicea? Same thing? Laodicea proclaims one thing, but what's the reality? The true witness says, no. You're something far different from what you think you are. So they are connected. Today, as we look at Smyrna, it's no different. Smyrna is intimately connected to Philadelphia. What's interesting about those two churches, they both fight against the synagogue of Satan. They both have the same fight ahead of them. The second thing is that neither Smyrna nor Philadelphia, Jesus says one negative thing about. All positive. Actually, words of encouragement, if you will. If you're thinking uh, maybe there's a way to memorize, I'll just share this as my own little key here, to memorize the seven churches. Here's the, here's the wording. Every Sabbath, praise the Son's perfect love. Wow, that's good. Every Sabbath, praise the Son's perfect love. Wow. Now, there's a couple doubles in there, the S's and the P's, but if you can remember, every Sabbath, praise the Son's perfect love, you'll know the seven churches in their order as long as you know Philadelphia comes before Laodicea <laughs> and Smyrna is the first S. So maybe it's not so helpful as I thought, but that's the way that I remember it. Revelation 2.8, as we begin here this morning, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write. So Smyrna physically existed there above Ephesus in what is modern-day Turkey. Uh, here's some ruins, some pictures of the ruins of Smyrna. Now, the name comes from Muran, which is an aromatic gum derived from the Arabian tree, the balsamodendron mira. I actually said that. Sweet All right. Sweet yeah, it gave off this, uh, this aromatic gum, which they used for embalming the dead. It's where we get the word myrrh. So when they came to Christ as a baby, the, uh, they brought gifts, right? Gold, frankincense, myrrh. They, they represented something. Gold, a gift you would give a king. Frankincense, a gift you would give a priest, and myrrh was for embalming the dead. Right. So a gift for his sacrifice, you could say, wow. right? So that's where the name comes from. Medicinally, it was used uh, as a salve. It was also burned as a sweet-smelling incense. All this will become relevant as we study this little king, this little, yeah, I almost said this little kingdom. There's a little city here of Smyrna. Now, what's interesting, you see these little, um, arches down here in the lower, you kind of see them just going back. Yeah. They had what was called an agora, which is a two-tiered marketplace. So this is the view from underneath, down where those arches are that we saw in the previous slide. Now, when you're thinking historically, 
uh, through the phase spiritually that, it, that the church moves through, we typically put the dates of 100 to 313 AD on the church of Smyrna. That would be the spiritual condition of the church from 100 to 313 AD. Now the text says, and to the angel, this, the church in Smyrna, write these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. And we're going to find that these are encouraging words because what Smyrna faced was death. What they faced was persecution at the severest measure. And so what Jesus was saying is that I have gone through the experience and I am alive forevermore. Now it's fascinating. The first and the last in the Greek here is the alpha and the Omega. Now, if you've study, ever studied that out, the alpha is without beginning and omega is without end. And so what's fascinating is that Jesus is basically saying, I am, the, I am forever past, forever future. But, with, but in between that, I cease to be for you. Wow. I stopped living because of you. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of Hades and of death. The eternal one experienced death for you and for me. He goes on to say, I know your works. By the way, this phrase, I know your works, is in every one of the messages to the seven churches. Does he know our works? Yes. Does he know the motives behind the works? Yes. Yeah, there's no escaping. I know your works, tribulation and poverty. Now, the word tribulation there is relative because this church existing from 100 to 313 AD under the Roman emperors is also known as the age of martyrdom. Now you have to remember these emperors, they played themselves off as a God. They believed that they should receive worship. They commanded it. And so you either had to burn incense or make a sacrifice or some sort of homage to say that, yes, I recognize that you are a superior being. Would the Christians do that? No. No, not the true Christians. They would not. And so starting with Nero and eventually getting into some of these emperors here, the persecution began to begin, become quite severe. Actually, down at the bottom, too, there, Diocletian and his successors is when it was the worst. Mm. Now, this is an artist's rendition. These are some pretty horrific things that were happening during this time. When they were turned in, and they would be persecuted by their Jewish neighbors, as well as the pagans around them. The Jews did not like the Christians either. And so when they were rounded up, when they would refuse to pay homage, a lot of times these emperors would bring them into the Colosseums. If you've ever heard the term a Roman candle, the root of that is that they would actually take, as you see the outer edge there, they would take these Christian men and women, they would wrap them in cloth and, and soak that cloth with a pitch of tar. And as the sun was setting, they would light them on fire as, a, as they would do their Colosseum games. And this would provide sort of a glow through the night. And in between, they would round up other men, women, and children that would not pay homage to these rulers. And they would feed them as entertainment to wild beasts. Oh and so you can imagine the horrific time that this would have represented for the church during the age of Smyrna. Now, Jesus has warned us ahead of time in countless scriptures. John 16, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have what? Peace. Peace. In the world you will have tribulation. He, said, he doesn't say you're going to escape it. He doesn't say there's going to be a secret rapture. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say that the church will be taken away before times of trouble. He says emphatically, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. John 15 and verse 20, Jesus says, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also what? Persecute you. You see, the closer we get to Christ, the closer we get to the experience that Christ had himself. And they either loved Christ or they hated him. Isn't that true? Nobody came into interaction with Christ and walked away saying, oh, you know, he was, he was a decent guy. I didn't feel either way. They were either drawn to him because they knew that he was superior to them or they were offended by him. And the more you and I reflect Christ, the more we will have the same experience. 
Jesus goes on to say, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. Jesus is telling the, the Smyrna Christians, you're physically poor, but spiritually rich. It's interesting because by the time you get down to our age, the Laodicean age, we're physically rich, spiritually poor. Yeah. Amazing. You know, we probably live in the, not probably, we do. We live in the richest nation in the world. When it comes to having things, we are physically rich. The fact that we have multiple pairs of shoes in a world where there are people that are making garbage into shoes tells you how rich physically we are. The fact we have a vehicle, I think, puts us in the bottom 11 percentile or something like that of the world's population. You have a car? Wow. Some of us have two or garages to put them in. Yeah. Smyrna Church would have taken great peace, comfort in James 2.5 where it said, listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? I don't think it's a stretch, brothers and sisters, to say that you and I will experience poverty. We will know what it means to lose every earthly support. Amen? Amen. This counsel is for us. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not. Now, the word blasphemy here literally means evil speaking. Jesus says, I know that you are struggling against those who speak evil of you, who turn you in. This evil speaking was done by those who say they are Jews and are not. Is this literal? Is Jesus talking literal here? Well, remember that we have to understand spiritual things spiritually, right? Romans 2, 28 and 29, for he is not a Jew who is one how? Outwardly. outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Jesus is saying that to be a Jew is a spiritual thing. It's always been that way. Galatians 3, 26 through 29, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. For those who were literal Jews, they put a lot of stock into who their father's 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 father was. Isn't that true? Tracing the lineage back to who? Abraham. In Galatians, Paul's telling us in Christ, we are Abraham's seed. We are grafted in to that family, and it's a faith lineage. It's always been that way. Galatians 3, 6 and 7, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of of Abraham. Didn't Jesus declare this openly when Nathanael came to him and he saw him coming from the distance? Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, of Nathanael, behold, an Israelite, what? Indeed. <laughs> that means that Nathanael could also have been not an Israelite. Indeed. Isn't that true? Now, Nathanael was physically Lineage-wise, he was an Israelite, but Jesus was saying, no, there was something internal that made him an Israelite. The phrase ended there in Revelation 2, 9, who say they are Jews and are not, but are of a synagogue of Satan. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 8. Jesus had a lot of interaction with those who said they were Jews, but they were not. John chapter 8. We're going to begin in verse 31. John chapter 8, verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage, bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, 
Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Mm -hmm. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And I tell the truth. Why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Were these literal Jews, physical Jews, but not Jews at all? They said they were Jews, but they were not. They were liars. And their father, Jesus says, was the devil, the synagogue, if you will, of Satan. Jesus continues in Revelation 2, verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Let's say that together, can we? Yes. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Amen. Amen. Some of the most common words that Jesus said were, do not be afraid mm -hmm. and do not fear. Mm -hmm. Luke 12, four through five. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. You know, our message in this great movement that we're a part of the three angels' messages begins with the cry, fear God, right? There's only one fear, only one reverence we should have, and it's not man. It's not his ordinances. It's not his commandments. It's not his dictates, but rather fear God. Amen? Amen. First Peter 3 and verse 14, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Acts 14, our scripture reading for today, the disciples exhorting the new followers to continue in the faith and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. We all know probably well, 2 Timothy 3.12, 3, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus may, might, could, hopefully not, yeah, <laughs> will suffer persecution. This message, brothers and sisters, is relevant to any living, breathing Christian today, isn't it? Hebrews 12, 3 and 4 tells us to be careful. Consider Christ, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. And then these are painful words here. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. You think you've begun? Paul, who was stoned twice, right? Shipwrecked, whipped, everything imaginable. And he writes the words, you have not yet resisted unto blood. Did Paul know what it was like to resist unto blood? Yeah, he knew. Now, this flies in the face, doesn't it? Of much of the message of Christianity, which is that we're going to poof away, yep. disappear, no problems, rosy life, prosperity message, yes. secret rapture. Tribulation happens once we're gone. Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans 5. It's so important that we understand why 
God would allow this to happen. Romans chapter 5. I've come across so many Christians who don't want to even study prophecy. Can you imagine? They don't even want to know because they say, I'm not going to be here. Breaks my heart. Where's the preparation? Where's the spiritual fortitude that they're going to need to go through these times? They will be shocked and amazed as they themselves may have to suffer persecution. And they're just not physically, mentally, spiritually ready for such an event. Romans chapter 5. Let's read verses 1 through 5. Romans 5, if I can get to the right chapter. Verses 1 through 5, Paul says, there, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, we also glory in what? tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character hope. Does tribulation uh, produce things? Yeah. Does it help us to grow in our experience with God? Mm -hmm. Verse 5, now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who, has, who was given to us. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 10 tells us the trials of life are God's workmen to remove the impurities and roughness from our character. Their hewing, squaring, and chiseling, their burnishing and polishing is a painful process. It is hard to be pressed down to the grinding wheel. But the stone is brought forth prepared to fill its place in the heavenly temple. Upon no useless material does the master bestow such careful, thorough work. Can you say amen? Mm -hmm. Are you going through trials? Mm -hmm. Rest in the fact that God sees such value in you that he is shaping, polishing, preparing you for your special place in his kingdom. Only his precious stones are polished after the similitude of a palace. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, my brethren, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Is Jesus coming back for a perfect people without spot or blemish? Then the polishing, the chiseling, the hammering must happen now. Amen? And we must submit to that chiseling and that hammering. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. Amen. Matthew 13, 20 and 21, but he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Is there testing that must happen to God's people yes. through times of persecution and tribulation? Has God demonstrated that clearly in his word as we look at every character of scripture? We see times of persecution, times of testing, times of trial. Even the 12 disciples, minus one, you look at their lives, you look at what history tells us happened to them. James, the brother of John, he was beheaded by Herod. Andrew, the brother of Peter, crucified on an X-shaped cross. Bartholomew, flayed alive and then beheaded. James, the brother of Jude, sawed in pieces. Jude himself thrust through with arrows. Matthew, stabbed with a sword. Peter, crucified upside down in Rome. Philip, hung. Simon, crucified. Thomas, killed with a spear. All those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Even John himself, as he enraged those around him with the straight testimony, they attempted to kill John as well. 
We read here in Acts of the Apostles, page 569, John was accordingly summoned to Rome to be tried for his faith. Here, before the authorities, the apostles' doctrine were misstated. False witnesses accused him of teaching seditious heresies. By these accusations, his enemies hoped to bring about the disciples' death. Does that sound familiar? I mean, anyone else experienced the same thing? Maybe Jesus, his master? John answered for himself in a clear and convincing manner and with such simplicity and candor that his words had a powerful effect. His hearers were astonished at his wisdom and eloquence. But the more convincing his testimony, the deeper was the hatred of his opposers. The emperor Domitian was filled with rage. He could neither dispute the reasoning of Christ's faithful advocate, nor match the power that attended his utterance of truth. Yet he determined that he would silence his voice. John was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil, but the Lord preserved the life of his faithful servant, even as he preserved the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. As the words were spoken, thus perish all who believe in that deceiver, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. John declared, my master patiently submitted to all that Satan and his angels could devise to humiliate and torture him. He gave his life to save the world. I am honored in being permitted to suffer for his sake. I am a weak, sinful man. Christ was holy, harmless, undefiled. He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. These words had their influence, and John was removed from the cauldron by the very men who had cast him in. And out of fear, John was exiled to Patmos to write the very words that you and I read this morning. Amen? Amen. Revelation 2.10, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Brothers and sisters, when he says that some of you would be thrown into prison, please keep in mind this was not the prison that you and I think of today. Prison equaled death. Prison was a death sentence. Think about it. John the Baptist never came out from behind those walls. Paul never came back from that imprisonment. John himself would have been killed if they knew they could have gotten away with it. Jesus said, I, if you're faithful unto death, I will give you the crown of life. Now that Greek word there for crown is Stephanus. It's a garland of victory. It's kind of like the Olympics that are going on right now. Back in Roman days, that crown was not a kingly crown like we typically envision, but rather a crown, a wreath, if you will, of victory that you have won. This is what Jesus is saying. If you are faithful unto death, I will give you a crown of life, a crown of victory. The Greek actually implies the crown that is life. You can see while every one of us faced with Jesus on that great day, we'll kneel before him and throw that crown at his feet. Amen. It's his life. It's his sacrifice. It's his love that bought us and brought us to that, that amazing place. And we will gladly throw that crown at his feet. Second Timothy, Paul says, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Revelation 12, speaking of the saints on that grand day, says, and they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the what? To the death. Let me ask you a very sincere question this morning. If they didn't love their lives to the death, they must have loved somebody else's life. Amen. You see how relevant the messages to the seven churches are in their order? Last week, we studied Ephesus. What was the problem with Ephesus? Ephesus, they had lost first their first love. And they were imperceptive that they had even lost it. Why? Because they were doing so many good things. Jesus gave accolades to the things that they were doing, and they lost sight of the fact that they didn't love the God who had brought them to that great place. We'll read again manuscripts here, 11, 
1906. They knew not that a change had taken place in their hearts and that they would have to repent because of the non-continuance of their first works. God, in his mercy, called for repentance, for a return to their first love and to the works that are always the result of true Christ-like love. As we said last time, people typically don't fall out of love in a moment. This is imperceptible. It's slow, gradual changes that come into the life that pull us away from Christ, and we don't even recognize that it's happening. You may be sitting here as we study the martyrs and those who did not love their lives to the death and say, me too. I will go to the death for him. I want to warn you, brothers and sisters. Peter had a similar problem, didn't he? Yes. Luke 22 and verse 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. How did, how did Peter respond to that? But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Wow. Was Peter ready for such an experience? No, no. It turns out he wasn't. No, he wasn't. Mm -hmm. I remind you again, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. There's nothing listed there that is more deceitful than the heart. That's it. The pinnacle of all deception lives within you. Wow. Wow. The heart itself is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Can you know it? I cannot know it. If you read on in the text, it says, I, the Lord, search the heart, know the mind. You know, I think it's interesting to get to a place where we'd be willing to die for our Lord, that we would really rather die than sin. There are some steps that God has laid out in the gospel experience that we must have. We must have them. We'll, we'll fall as quickly as Peter did if we don't. Mount of Blessing, page 13. Throughout the Beatitudes, there is an advancing line of Christian experience. You know the Beatitudes, right? Matthew 5. Let's turn there real quick. Because we're told here in inspiration that these have an advancing line of Christian experience. You know what that tells me? One of the Beatitudes leads to the another, and then to the other, and then to the other. Let's go to Matthew 5. And just read them quickly. Matthew 5, beginning in verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on the mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Notice which step that one comes in. That's the, mm -hmm. that's the last beatitude. <laughs> I know. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If these are an advancing line of Christian experience, when are you and I safe to be persecuted? Yeah. You ever have the wrong experience of persecution in, in this life, right? I have. Something's been said or done, and I've responded in a way that is not Christ-like at all. Was I ready? No. No. This is a great slide, which shows us the advancing steps here. The bottom step, blessed are the poor in spirit. What do we have to first do? We have to recognize our spiritual poverty. That's step one. We can't even get to step two without step one. What's step two? Blessed are those who mourn. We must have a true mournful experience over our own sinful choices, right? This, this would bring a repentance that wouldn't need to be repented from, wouldn't it? Not the same old fall down, get up, fall down, get up, fall down, get up over the same sin. I want to have real repentance, don't yeah, you? Freedom. Well, step one's got to be there. We need to know our condition. Step two will follow. We will be broken in godly sorrow. Step three, we will then humbly submit to God. That's the meekness that Jesus talks about. Step four will naturally develop as we will then hunger and thirst internally for the righteousness that we know we don't have. The next step comes naturally. We will then show mercy to others. 
withholding deserved punishment. The next one, again, develops naturally. We will develop a pure heart, authentic. We will then become peacemakers looking to make reconciliation, wanting to make reconciliation, shuddering at the fact that we would ever withhold that from somebody. And then we are ready to suffer for Christ. Let's talk about the Smyrna church and their experience for a few minutes. Historically, this is what they faced. I wonder if there are any parallels to the life we're living right now. The Roman emperor Trajan laid down the first official Roman policy toward Christianity. In the famous 99, or 97th letter written to Pliny the Younger, his governor in Bithynia, and Pontus in Asia Minor, Trajan outlined a procedure for dealing with Christians who were at that time an illegal religious society. He ordered that Roman officials were not to hunt Christians out, but that if persons were brought before them for other offenses and proved to be Christians, they were to be executed unless they recanted. This regulation, though by no means uniformly enforced, remained the law until Constantine issued his Edict of Toleration in AD 313. Thus, for two centuries, Christians were constantly subject to the possibility of sudden arrest and death for their faith. Their well-being depended in large measure upon the favor of their pagan and Jewish neighbors who might either leave them in peace or complain against them before the authorities. This might be termed permissive persecution. The emperor did not take the initiative in persecuting Christians, but permitted his own representatives and local authorities to take such measures against Christians as they might see fit. This policy left Christians to the mercy of the various local administrations under which they lived, especially in times of famine, earthquake, storm, and other catastrophes, Christians found themselves the objects of attack. Their pagan neighbors, supposing that by refusing to worship the gods of the Christians, had brought divine wrath upon the whole country, the whole community. In other words, it's for the common good that you bow down, that you worship the emperors. Otherwise, famines, pestilences, they're coming upon us because you won't submit. I wonder. Are there any, is there anything happening in society right now where we're seeing freedoms break down, where we're seeing groupthink be brought into the spectrum? It's on the table. Everybody should submit. Everybody should fall in line. Everybody should make this choice for the good of others, right? It's happening in real time. This was just yesterday. Biden pushes mandate injections on local government. He's not making the mandate from a federal level. He's dispersing it out to local governments. The hidden agenda is, of course, local governments better put these things into play, right? These freedoms, I am not in any way saying are the mark of the beast. I don't care what your position is on, on the injection. My fear, and fear is probably a bad word, my concern is that this is setting the table for what we know will soon become a religious issue. Amen? Amen. Revelation 13 tells us that there will be a death penalty. It says he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. You see, today, brothers and sisters, we are making decisions about whether we will accept that mark in the future. Like Daniel, who refused to change his worship style based on the dictates of men, opened those windows just like he did every other day, we are making decisions right now whether we will bow in fear or whether we will come and worship as we always have and by God's grace always will. Amen? Amen. Let's talk about the 10 days prophetically. On the basis of the year-day principle of reckoning prophetic time periods, it has been interpreted as a period of 10 literal years, a day for a year in Bible prophecy, right? And applied to the period of the most severe imperial persecution. 
begun by Diocletian and continued by his associate and successor, Galerius. This was an attempt to wipe out Christianity by burning the scriptures, destroying church buildings, and imprisoning the leaders. Some of that's happening around the world right now. These rulers believed that the church had grown to such dimensions of strength and popularity in the empire that unless Christianity should be promptly stamped out, the traditional Roman way of life would cease to exist and the empire itself would disintegrate. Consequently, the inaugurated they inaugurated a policy designed to exterminate the church. Diocletian's first decree against Christians was issued in the year 303, banning the practice of Christianity throughout the empire. Persecution began in the army and spread throughout the empire. The Roman authorities concentrated their terrors on the Christian clergy in the belief that if the shepherds were removed, the flock would scatter. How many have seen the, the news articles where they have removed pastors from churches that refused to stop meeting? Just me? A couple of you? Yeah, go to, go to the look up Canada and the stuff that's happening there. The horrors of this persecution, by the way, how bad was it, are vividly described by the church historian Theo, or De, I don't know how you say his name, who describes the gathering of the bishops of the church to the Council of Nicaea some years after the end of the persecution. How bad was it? Some came without eyes, some without arms, which had been pulled from their sockets, others with their bodies horribly maimed in different ways. Many, of course, did not survive this time of trouble. In 313, 10 years after the beginning of these persecutions, Constantine and his colleague Licinius issued an edict that granted Christians and all others liberty to practice their religion. One of those early church leaders that stood for the truth was named Polycarp. Polycarp was well known in the Christian community as one who stood for the faith. Stood though the heavens fall, we could say, right? Now, he was brought before the Roman proconsul, and because of his age, they attempted to grant him some mercy. And they said, Polycarp, if you, if you revile Christ, if you renounce his followers, we'll let you go. This was his response. For 86 years, I have been the servant of Christ, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? I'm a Christian. When the proconsul threatened Polycarp with wild beasts and then with fire, Polycarp replied, why are you waiting? Come, do what you will. Yes. Does that sound like a man that oh, feared God? Uh, Amen. Amen. And he did die by the flame. Now, just an interesting side note. This is before Christianity really suffered from within. These were people that loved God to the death, and they hung true to the straight and the narrow. This is from historians. It says, because the uh, smear, I don't know, smear, smear, <laughs> because the letter known as the martyrdom of Polycarp states that Polycarp was taken on the day of the Sabbath and killed on the great Sabbath. Some believe that this is evidence that the Smyrnians, or however you say that, under Polycarp observed the seventh day Sabbath. William Cave, an historian, wrote the Sabbath or Saturday, for so the word sabbatum is constantly used in the writings of the fathers when speaking of it as it relates to Christians, was held by them in great veneration and especially in the eastern parts honored with all the public solemnities of religion. So still Sabbath keepers during this time of the church age. Again, brothers and sisters, each day, you and I are either stepping upward or we're stepping downward. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. Luke 16, 10, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. If you want to know, am I going to pass the trials that are coming, the big trials? The real question is, am I passing the little ones today? Be faithful in the little, you'll be faithful in the much. Revelation 2.11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, right now, as we sit here this morning, there are thousands of songs in this room. They're playing right now. Different genres, different styles of music are playing right now, thousands of them right here in this room. Can anybody hear them? You know why you can't hear them? 
because you don't have the frequency, you don't have the ability to capture that frequency. There are radio waves of probably hundreds of radio stations ripping through this building right now. Ham radios from other countries right through here. We need spiritual ears to hear the words of God, don't we? Yes. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Yep. I want to have spiritual ears, don't you? Yes. Oh, Lord, open our ears. Open our eyes that we can see. Help us to understand just where we live. I think if we truly knew with our heart of hearts the day and the hour in which we lived, this place would be packed beyond capacity. Mm -hmm. And our lives would be desperately different when we left here. Mm -hmm. The ending promise, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Are you willing, you think, to suffer the first death both spiritually and physically? So that, the, that Christ's sacrifice can save you from the second? Because that's what we're talking about. It's appointed unto men to die how many times? Once, then the judgment. But there is a second death. That is the death. That's the punishment for sin that Christ paid for you and I. By God's grace, not one of us has to experience the second death. Amen? Many of us may have to suffer the first one. Revelation 20, as it opens the doors in the future, and we see maybe some of us, hopefully all of us, standing right there with God. It says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been, what? Beheaded. All oh, these must be martyrs of the past. Days of the dark ages, right? Does the text give us any clues as to what time period they were beheaded? It says, who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Let me ask you, is the mark of the beast enforced right now? That's still future. If these people had been beheaded, because they wouldn't worship the beast or his image, then these people will be beheaded in a future time. Right. Amen? Mm -hmm. Many of us may be called to such a death. And I hope that our spirits are such that we rejoice like Peter did when he was beaten for Christ's sake. I hope that we will rejoice saying, he suffered for us. I am more than willing to suffer for him. Amen? If we were to suffer a death like that, we can have hope in Revelation 20 and verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. We all want to be a part of that, right? If, we don't, if we're not alive when Jesus comes, I want to come up in the first, don't you? Amen. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And then that final judgment will take place. Verses 14 and 15, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Brothers and sisters, we do not want to be a part of that experience. Last quote before we close. Early writings, page 47. We must be partakers of Christ's sufferings here if we would share in his glory hereafter. If we seek our own interest, how can we, how can we, how we can, thank you, <laughs> how we can best please ourselves instead of seeking to please God and advance his precious suffering cause. We shall dishonor God and the holy cause we profess to love. We have but a little space of time left in which to work for God. I, I, Wow. I tell you, those words have never been more relevant than right now. Yep. Nothing. How much? Nothing. What should come between? Nothing should be too dear to sacrifice for the salvation of the scattered and torn flock of Jesus. Would that include our own lives? Yeah. Those who make a covenant with God by sacrifice now will soon be gathered home to share a rich reward and possess the new kingdom forever and ever. Amen. 
May God find us faithful. Amen. Amen.